Hey, everyone. Today, I'm joined by Greg Henriquez. Uh, Greg is a dear friend, but uh, most will know him as the developer of the Unified Theory of Knowledge Framework, or UTOC, uh, author of a new Unified Theory of Psychology from 2011, um, as well as a new synthesis for solving the problem of psychology, addressing the enlightenment gap, uh, which is just uh, the academic side of Greg's work, which uh, as a totality goes very deep and is very expansive in terms of the UTOC framework, which we'll be talking about a little bit in a minute. Uh, I want to have Greg on because there's this really exciting, amazing, awesome conference that's coming up this weekend, and I wanted to make people aware of it. And uh, so we'll just kind of, yeah, Amen. outline. Yeah we'll, yeah, we'll outline a little bit what that's going to look like and, and get into all that. But uh, Greg, thanks for taking the hey, time. Uh, yeah. It's always lovely to chat with you, uh, dear friend. Uh, yeah. And I'm excited about uh, the conference and your contributions and other things uh that and uh, a book, you know, with the with the also the you talk book coming out, yeah, um, at some level. So, uh, super cool stuff to be uh joined with you on, and it's lovely to be here, yeah. Thanks. No, I you know, we've been talking in sort of the you talk community about 20 about this year being a, a big year for you talk and, and and people really engaging with this framework, and so I'm excited just to do whatever I can to make that happen more. I'm a, I'm, I can't say enough about the value of this framework. And, um, I feel like, uh, yeah, this is just going to be a big time as people, um, get to become more familiar with it and what it does and how the sense it can bring to our understanding of reality. It's, um, once you kind of plug into this, um, and, and it kind of informs your, your whole understanding of, where where we come from and what what we're made up of and uh, how we're composed the different sort of layers and levels of our psyche and our being and all this stuff uh, in a deeply grounded scientific naturalistic way it's just uh, it's remarkable so um, I think uh, that hopefully for a lot of people this conference will be a, a, an introduction to that yeah um, I hope so yeah so so well you know I, I won't be I won't effusively glow about it anymore explain give a, a, br a brief summary for people who maybe have heard of this before but yep. what is you talk what is this unified theory of knowledge Great. Just give a little sense of that yeah thank you so much uh well okay so just first since we mentioned the conference we'll give a link to that oh yeah uh, definitely. it's people can register for it for free so if you're not doing anything Friday or Saturday it's coming right up yep. uh Friday or seven Saturday um I think we have 16 total symposia uh, mm -hmm. that are being shared over 60 different presenters. Four of them actually, four symposia are going to be uh, in Portuguese from Brazilian scholars. My partner, Masia, uh, has made a bunch of connections over there. So that's a cool thing. Um, it is our second UTOC conference. Um, the first one was uh, towards uh, unifying knowledge and orienting towards wisdom. It really was for folks in this corner of the internet to come together, uh, to share where they are and see sort of conceptually the overlap. Um, this one's a little different, uh, similar to that, only this time the theme is on Utah itself, uh, or at least something that's Utah adjacent. Uh, so to what extent does Utah afford us um, a capacity, a framework that is consilient? Um, so I can talk a little bit about that. Uh, in fact, the opening line, uh, first hour is on Utah uh, itself. Um, so that I'll share with folks who haven't heard of it or, or whatever, just give them a little frame. So yeah. let's start with what is unified theory of knowledge. Okay. Um, so unified, uh, the first, first word there, um, comes off of it and means the same thing as what E.O. Wilson termed as consilience, um, which is a jumping together of, of different elements, facts, ideas to create a common ground, a coherent common ground of explanation. Okay. So like, how do we explain stuff? Um, and we are not consilient, meaning we in the academy, the academic structure uh, doesn't afford an opportunity to say, hey, this is kind of the landscape and this is how you make sense out of the landscape. In fact, it's a chaotic, fragmented pluralism. You can make sense out of it any different way. And you got it's up to each person or a little group to sort of see where they are and see how they connect to the larger whole. But there is no larger whole grounding. Um, uh, from a Utah perspective, uh, that's a there's a lot more opportunity to coherently frame our understanding. Uh, then we take it place uh, that takes place in the academy. Uh, so it, the argument from you talk is actually is much more coherence that's available to us um, across, say, the great branches of learning. Uh, if you say the great branches, that's natural sciences, the social sciences and the humanities. Um, there's actually a way to interrelate those domains uh, and make much more sense out of them. So that's consilience. 
And then it's a unified theory of knowledge, um, which basically says, okay, how do we know about the world and what is the world? Um, uh, and so you talk actually says that actually we know about the world uh, through sort of different epistemologies uh, that give us different frames on how we experience and make sense out of it. Um, so for example, the first one it concerns itself with uh, historic is like, what is modern science? Okay, so modern science is a particular kind of epistemology uh, meaning that it knows about the world a particular way. Uh, and then what what is the reality that modern science gives us? And I make the case in that book, in the new synthesis in particular, that modern science fundamentally is a behavioral epistemology. That means it divides the world up into entities and ob uh, and fields and tracks them and measures them. Uh, and then it can and we can build a unfolding wave. Uh, of, of behavioral layers uh, at the level coming off of energy into mat material layer um, of existence. So then there's a living layer of existence, what I call a mind or mind animal layer of existence, and then a culture person layer of existence. Um, and so this is the tree of knowledge gives us a framework for thinking about objective science epistemology. But it's really important to understand that that's one way to make sense out of the world. And it's actually blind in certain ways to other ways of making sense. Like, for example, your first person experience of being in the world. <laughs> okay. In many ways, science is about factoring that out and seeing what we can know, which we can know a lot. But that actually means there's a blind spot. In fact, that's the name of a recent book um, uh, uh, that on, hey, how do we incorporate human experience into the world? Uh, Utah says that's a different epistemology. It's the language of the subject. Uh, and I built this thing called the iQuad coin to actually at least serve first as a placeholder. And then if you learn the system, it networks together. Um, so the unified theory of knowledge gives us an understanding of objective knowledge through science, subjective knowledge through the psyche. And then ultimately it says we got to come together uh, and build meaning making systems, uh, justific shared justification systems of is and ought collection of cultural constructions of knowledge. Um, this is sort of a second person view of the world um, uh, that gives rise to kind of our shared belief value structures about what's good and true in the world. Um, sort of your intersubjective vector. Uh, and the Utah represents that with what's called the garden. Um, so one way to think about Utah is it says, hey, there's different epistemologies that give us different angles. We haven't been able to put the objective, subjective and intersubjective together. Uh, Utah gives us new frameworks for doing those and shows how they can be a lot more coherently integrated. Um, so that's that's one uh, angle on Utah. It's three core philosophical pillars uh, that yeah. organize the objective science view, the subjective psyche view, and the cultural collection of uh, construction of knowledge. Awesome. Yeah. The tree of knowledge as the multi-layered complexity wave unfolding from matter or to, from energy life energy to matter, life, mind, culture, uh, and beyond. Uh, and then the kind of notion of this subjective experience of, of reality, which, which you use the symbol of the, the coin for, uh, and then, uh, and that, and the garden as representing our intersubjective relationship to each other and how we make sense of things and the stories of, uh, uh, that we that we use to make sense of reality and justify our actions and the and develop the justification systems that allow us to have knowledge of the world or or understand it and that sort of a thing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it's a beautiful system. It's it's a an integral in, integrated perspective uh, of 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 knowledge, bringing all these different ways of knowing together, situating different fields of knowledge in relationship to each other, and. Um, and yeah, it's a beautiful system. So thanks. That's a, I mean, obviously there's a million, million more things that could be said about it. And you've done a great series, actually. Um, uh, you've got a YouTube series where you kind of break down some of the core concepts and ideas of, of the system. So I'll link that as well. So people great. can- Great. Yeah. That's you called know. Now You Talking. Yeah. Uh, and it says we, we're lacking some clear definitions of things like behavior and mind and cognition and metamodernism. Uh, uh, although some of us have defined that very brilliantly, I might add. <laughs> Somewhere around here somebody defined that brilliantly um but it, it affords ways to then introduce the you talk vocabulary and critique some the ways these terms are at least floating around and show how they can be interconnected that's the now you yeah. talking series cool so all right so 
now that, well, one, people have a general frame, and presumably most people watching this already have some kind of a general frame, let's talk about this conference. I mean, this Great. is an, a really exciting thing. We've got so many people uh, that are going to be involved that, uh, again, people will 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 know about John Verveke, Bobby Azarian, Benita Roy. I mean, we could almost, uh, well, maybe let's not go through the each individual symposium necessarily, but um, maybe just outline kind of the vision for the, the conference totally. and some, some notable things and what, yeah, just right. anything so, like that. So so I'll yeah. say uh, here. So I just gave you an architecture, one way to think about Utah. Uh, I'll flip it around, and do something that John likes to do, uh, and I like to do too. We're academics; we like to problematize. Okay, uh, and and critiquing the current system. Uh, I look out at the field of our current knowledge, and I would argue that we're we are quite confused at the level of our broad philosophy. I call it an, uh, the Enlightenment gap, and more recently, the problem of natural philosophy. This is a problem of how do we understand natural science relative to human history? How do we understand science relative to the subjective? So there is a serious problem here called the enlightenment gap, which is how do we place matter and mind together? How do we place those epistemological vectors together? Um, so there's a big picture issue about philosophy uh, that we haven't resolved. There's a problem of psychology, like what is psychology? What is human psychology? How do we relate the science of psychology to the experience of the subject? That's a real big question. You talk manages and clarifies some aspects of that. Uh, my, the actual journey starts with a problem of psychotherapy, which is like, what's adaptive valued living? How do we make judgments about values in, a different, in addition to human functioning? What should a psychological doctor do? Uh, and then finally, the problem of the subject, the psyche, and what's its connection to big, large knowledge? And, and how do we know what our subjective knowledge is relative to objective and intersubjective? And how do we tie those? So the problem of natural philosophy, the problem of um, psychology, the problem of psychotherapy, and the problem of the psyche. Now, I mentioned that um, all actually, by the way, relative to our ultimate value orientation, the problem of God, <laughs> as it were. I mentioned that because we have 16 symposia um, that are coming. You know, each one of these have, most of them have three presenters plus a moderator. Um, uh, some of them are from Portuguese or four from Portuguese. So 16, like over 60 presenters. And what I would argue, when we look at what these presentations are, um, we can see that they're trying to, they're, we can place them as part of how you talk and these uh, thinkers are grappling either with essentially the big picture philosophy issue. Um, so for example, you and I, we would come back to this, but we're talking about metamodernism. Uh, metamodernism bridging the social sciences and the humanities. And I would argue once we marry it to you talk, then we can bring in the natural sciences and get a coherent big picture view. So that's a, hey, how are we addressing this problem of philosophy and consilience? Um, me and John uh, and Benita Roy, John Verbeke, Benita Roy, Alexander Bard, uh, will be dialoguing about naturalism versus emergentism. Uh, and Bard is going to critique some of uh, why we shouldn't be grounded in naturalism. I'm going to defend that a little bit. We'll see where that evolves. But that's another sort of new worldview, and Benita Roy will be bringing her um, uh, recent and deep musings on, on metaphysics uh, to that conversation, and we'll be talking about transcendent naturalism. Uh, Bobby Azarian is going to be talking about new visions with other folks on new visions of religion and science for the 21st century. Uh, so those are examples, then, uh, of, of how we were addressing sort of the problem of philosophy and bringing new pictures to that. Uh, I'll pause there and see, but the rest of the symposia actually can fall under the problem of psychology, uh, problem of psychotherapy, problem of psyche. And actually we end uh, with your good friend and my good friend, Layman Pascal, leading a conversation on God, uh, science and wisdom. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll name some of the um, symposia Great. too. I'll we tell got, you, so yeah, we're there. Uh-huh. Yeah, so you got uh, starting out on, so this is, again, going from April uh, 12th to the 13th. So the whole thing kicks off 9 a.m. Uh, on uh, uh, the Eastern 12th. time on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yep, on Friday. Friday. Uh, and and that'll be you introducing, you talk, even uh, the a conference, sense of, getting us all on the same page, giving a little bit of the overview of just what I started there. Yeah. The problems and its pillars, things like that. Mm -hmm. That'll lead into that. Uh, that presentation or symposium discussion that you talked about just now on emergentism versus naturalism with, uh, right. with That's the invited symposia, uh, with me and Bard and John and Bonnie. Yep. Uh, me, Bard, Bonnie and John, <laughs> <laughs> Johnny. <laughs> and, uh, 
Oh, that's interesting. Johnny Verbeke. <laughs> uh, it's got an interesting ring to it. Uh, and then at 1 p.m., there's like multiple options. Uh, and uh, and and here again, we'll we'll come back in a second and talk uh, because uh, you, I, and Jason Storm are all going to be uh, jamming on on the relationship of you talking about modernism. Uh, but got some different things going on there. Rick Rapetti and uh, Christopher Master Pietro uh, and, and folks are also doing something uh, on justification systems as a, yeah. a and, and virtue. Um, mm -hmm. And, they're doing uh, a dialectic into D logo, so they're they're sharing uh, John's psychotechnology or, or the Vivek Foundation psychotechnology on how to cultivate reflection on that in a small group process. And we're taking a twist on that and dropping the concept of justification and seeing if they can bridge that both to understand what it is and connect it to virtue. Um, hmm. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Yeah. Um, then there's one on uh, you talk in art. That sounds really interesting. Uh, and then oh. the one that you mentioned about Bobby Azarian. This one is really, you know, uh, up my alley in this sort of stuff. I, I find fascinating. It's called Visions of Science and Religion in the 21st Century with with Bobby, uh, Ken Baskin, Scott Jordan and Tyler Volk. And uh, Tyler Volk is a, a big history thinker, author of Combo Genesis. And I mean, you two have written uh, some some uh, academic work together. Uh, kind of uniting big history uh, with the Utah framework. Um, and then Saturday, uh, the 13th, uh, we got John Verveke and you talking about uh, the fourth R. What, what's going on with that one? Yeah. Uh, so this conversation made an hour long conversation uh, about syncing up uh, recursive relevance realization uh, and the influence matrix um, to show how we can utilize recursive relevance realization as the cognitive perceptual framing uh, and the influence matrix tracking what are the relevance dimensions in relation as we drop in. Uh, so essentially what it says is, hey, we'll bring a frame, we'll track each other, we're tracking, the matrix says that we're actually uh, at a motivational, emotional level, we're tracking our social influence and relational value, uh, we're tracking dimensions of hierarchy, we're tracking dimensions of love relative to hate, uh, as it were, uh, freedom uh, relative to dependency. Uh, and these are these are dynamic kind of dialectical elements uh, that are often pulled against one another. Uh, so we're going to say explore that. John has a way in which the cultural grammar of relationship uh, can may be framed by this kind of element. I'm going to be moving more towards the idea of, hey, how do we understand the therapeutic relationship and healing relationship? Because this bridges to some of the other ideas mm -hmm. called the common core I can touch on in, of psychotherapy. Um, which gets at the process and participatory dynamics of the therapeutic healing relationship. Mm. And the argument is that we should be actually helping therapists. They do this intuitively, but we can make this explicit. What is the relational frame you enter into? And how do you track recursive relevance realization with the process dimensions and navigate them? Uh, mm. And so th that's what we'll be exploring in that. So the fourth R is recursive relevance realization in relation, in the relational mm. world. Cool. So. That'll be fun. And I mean, every time you and John get together and do anything, it's always very fascinating. You've done some great series. Uh, your current one, which I believe is still ongoing, right? Transcendent Naturalism. Yeah, we had to put a pause on it a little bit. We are going to bring back uh, uh, two of our favorite interlocutors to wrap it up. And that's cool. Lehman Pascal and uh, Bruce Alderman. Nice. We're trying to get a final uh, section uh, of the to bring their opinion. John and I will then summarize and they will share their wisdom nice. uh, in relationship to it to bring that yeah. uh, series to a, a cool close. That was an amazing series um, and with some really fascinating uh right there was one guy in particular who talked about the meaning of meaning there that was really you know i had to go back and watch that well again. i was in some i was in very <laughs> uh i was it, it was impressive company because you guys had some incredible uh other guests on and um and just the whole framing of of that series in general is just so important uh you know all the more so i think um you know as we're moving into uh, more choppy waters in terms of how people are making sense of reality and the kinds of sense making frameworks that they have and the and the the challenges that people have when trying to bring meaning and spirituality into their lives uh, in the context or not of an of of naturalism of science and these sorts of things. And yeah. so you know yeah. it's yeah. I mean you know you know my stance on this is I mean first off everybody's got to find their path of course. Um, but I wish uh there to me there's we can correct our naturalistic vision and when we do correct our naturalistic vision from its coherent incoherent chaotic fragmented pluralism mm -hmm. into a coherent integrated pluralism um our our relationship to ourselves in the world 
uh, is transformed. And, and this is actually now we can correct some of the errors and know uh, stuff. Uh, so I, I, that's why I hope attention to you talk and it's coherent endo natural frame. It's like, okay, we can, we can ground ourselves in, in knowledge here and in, in embodied, reliable, valid, uh, knowledge. Um, that's not to eschew other elements, but it mm -hmm. is certainly something that I wish, uh, you know, would get the attention it deserves. Yeah. And I guess just to hang out on that point for one second, and then I'll come back to the rest of these. Um, it's so interesting. I hadn't thought about this in these terms before, but in many ways, that is kind of what your work and the Utah framework helps do is like correct for the historical failures of, you could even just say naturalism. It's sort of an update oh. to naturalism. It's a correction for it. And because unfortunately, a lot of the glaring, uh, uh, what would you say, um, sort of the missing pieces and the blind spots and uh, the problems with our current way of approaching these scientific issues, or let's just say knowledge in general, it seems to like uh, undermine maybe in some people's eyes, the notion of, you know, naturalism or something. And so, Completely. and so, uh, a lot of what this conference is about and what you talk in general, I think offers is a way of correcting for those, uh, those problems, uh, and, and sort of filling in what's missing so that, um, we can get, uh, yeah, kind of in right relationship yeah, I mean, to these sorts so, of things. Right. So I, I am actually, will be introduced. I did it in a blog as a lead up to this. So one of the things that, uh, people may have heard me talk about the uh, enlightenment gap. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the consequence of what I'm now calling the problem of natural philosophy, um, which is basically as physics grips the world, this third person put nature in the language of mathematics from a third person observing, measuring perspective as it, to describe the behavior of matter, especially as it manifests in Newton. Newton's natural philosophy, which, by the way, is what it, he called it uh, back then, uh, was a mathematization mm -hmm. of natural philosophy. Um, but but what happens is that breaks the world in two, uh, and we see the emergence of dualism, you know, supernatural dualism or Cartesian dualism. We see idealism and materialism, and and all of these are none of these are adequate. These are the standard frames, mm -hmm. none of which are uh, right relation to what to the unfolding wave of behavioral complexification across the stratified dimensions of energy, matter, life, mind, and culture. And I would argue scientifically, we are and philosophically, we should all know that. Like that should be old news, yeah. Um, and, but it's not, of course. Uh, but you talk wants to make all that old news and and transcend the old categories of matter versus mind, and either it's all matter, materialism, yeah. it's all mind, idealism, right. it's some substantial combination. No, it's a pr behavioral process with different epistemologies that can be yoked together if you see this emerging complexification patterning uh, that's the tree of knowledge maps it. So yeah. Um, well, let's, I'll just finish off, uh, describing or naming some of the, the, the sessions that to me seem really right. enticing. Uh, and then we'll dive into unpacking actually some of that for a minute. Cause that'll be fun. Um, I'm just seeing also, you know, oh, well actually this one I'll be moderating the Bildung and enlightenment 2.0 with Lena, Rachel Anderson, uh, Robert Bungie and Brandon Norgard. Um, well, yeah, be... so I'm, a, I'm excited about that. I'll be in an all alternative one at the time. So I had to. Uh, had to tag you uh, to be a moderator for that one. And of course, Lene uh, and Zach right came to uh, and offered some uh, visionary uh, perspectives on education and what Bill Tung is. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, I've been a long uh, advocate for how do we think about character and moral development? How do we fuse that into citizenship? How do we fuse that? And of course, that's Lene's, um, you know, yeah. uh, Bill Tung perspective, uh, in which I've been a big fan of. Um and uh, I wish, you know, as I told her, I still prefer meta modernity the, to poly modernity, but I very much appreciate the basic uh, gist uh, of the sort of heuristic outline that she offers about sort of the evolution and perspective on culture. Um, and Robert Bungie's been doing some really cool stuff on educating folks in the tech world mm -hmm. and wondering about how, why we need a big picture view uh, as we educate folks in general, but particularly educate them in the information tech world at the time of the fifth joint point. Uh, and Brendan Norgard, you know, got a good systemic thinker about how, how we should put stuff together, how we can think about Enlightenment 2.0 um, and how to apply you talk to a number of different areas. And so um, that's going to be a cool conversation, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I also, um, I skipped over it uh, earlier before that at, at 10 a.m. There's two really cool things going on. One is justifying social justice, finding unity in a diversity of perspectives with Brad Kirshner, Michael Moscolo, and Stephen Quackenbush. I love, I mean, uh, I, I don't know Stephen so well, but Brad, 
Uh, Brad is a wonderful guy and has written some great stuff on this topic. Michael Moscolo, of course, is a brilliant uh, psychologist. And uh, I think you guys are uh, uh, old friends, but he also he's done fascinating work. I had him on the podcast a, a little while yeah, ago. And uh, he was a great podcast. Yeah. Uh, and Steve's a great guy. Steve's actually been longer connected to me long, uh, longer than anybody on this ride. Nice. Um, and, uh, he's obsessed with the problem of value in mm. the world. Awesome. Uh, and, uh, he's a, a great, uh, fan of Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, existentialist thinker, moral development. He, he worked, uh, uh, on Kernberg stuff in terms of his dissertation. He's a developmental moral psychologist and theoretical, uh, thinker, um, who, who was a fan at some level of consilience, uh, but also didn't felt like it did not. He didn't have the word for it at the time, but really didn't handle the problem of justification. Mm. Uh, then he found you talk and was like, actually, this really is uh, Sartre's core concerns is that mm. we are agents uh, that are aware of our justificatory structure. And that changes the way we're going to grip the world. And that opens up the whole problem of like, how ought to we grip the world? Mm. And that's a, that's what Steve Quackenbush has been obsessed with his life nice. uh, is how ought to we grip the world. Uh, and then he found you talk and has been a big fan and supporter of that, a fascinating guy. And, and all of those folks are, you know, part in education. And so here we have, uh, and certainly I'll say this uh, for me, and I put a blog out on this, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty uh, clear that aspects of the academy in particular with its emphasis what I call woke 2.0, um, essentially a rigid, uh, almost fundamentalist emphasis on race, on oppression uh, categories, intersectionality, um, to basically impute that as the right moral, you know, belief value is almost like a, with religious fervor. Mm -hmm. That's happened in the academy. I think that's actually quite damaging, uh, mm -hmm. both to the ends uh, of what folks want to do, as well as that alienating, hyperpolarization, sure. politically destructive thing. Uh, and that conversation is going to be, well, how will we do it right? I mean, each yeah. of them are have, you know, sort of liberal left hearts, yeah. um, uh, white guys, <laughs> but have liberal left hearts that are like, there is a way uh, to create an, an appreciation for, say, the systemic injustices that people have felt, and yet have a wise, inclusive, flourishing uh, orientation. I really look forward to that. That's awesome. Yeah. And again, yeah, the all nuanced thinkers and and uh, very bright. So that, that'll be very fascinating. This one, uh, the UTIC fundamental shift in TSK inquiry is probably the most uh, uh, curious to me um, and maybe maybe the most in, in need of uh, 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 some uh, explication, especially, specifically around UTIC. But uh, that one's going to be with Rob Scott, Bruce Alderman, and Baron Short. Again, yep. also just incredibly intelligent, brilliant, wonderful people. But um, yeah, do you, uh, what's going yeah, on? Talk, well, certainly as you, you know, people on this channel, probably I hope for Bruce Alderman on brilliant, uh, wise uh, thinker, he's going to be bringing the TSK. That's time space knowledge, which is a sophisticated sort of East West bridge mm -hmm. approach to mindfulness uh, structure and how to think about oneself uh, as a, both a, a perspective in the world and then how to, distance or or network that one many perspective uh, across all sorts of different uh, angles on time space uh relative framing uh so bruce is going to be sharing uh his wisdom in relationship to that perspective which he's well versed in uh, i've explored that i found it to be super fascinating um then you get rob scott uh a a f philosopher who you know lives a very difficult life on his own account uh gets brutalized by life wakes up at 19 um, and then really sort of, in my estimation, in a sort of a modern Western way, rediscovers what the Buddha discovered in certain mm. kinds of ways and, and is able to articulate it, uh, certainly articulated to me in a profound way of how to be very aware of the lenses our identity brings to the world relative to the witness function and then the connection mm. um, with the embodied sensory motor loop of just isness. Uh, in you talk, we would then identify sort of the difference between pure awareness Close your eyes, open your eyes, uh, and your mind to present you with gestalts uh, that are sort of as essentially the undeniable unit of subjectivity. If like Rene Descartes, when he says, I think, therefore I am, really, it's like, I am experiencing this moment of awareness. Mm. Um, and then to get in touch with that and to identify that relative to identifying with your core self gripping the world or your ego or your persona. So what Rob Scott shows is like, hey, there's a there's an identity shifting, which are pragmatic shifts. I call it the best damn cognitive therapy I ever heard, which is like, what's the adaptive identity that you want to bring to bear to the contact? 
And then ultimately, and this is sort of a shift he's made is actually you can shift from the ego, the core self, the persona into isness itself. And just to identify with experience and feel the beauty of that. So he'll be talking some about that. He's done a number of you talk. And then finally, my most recent now best you know, friend, I've got all these best friends, uh, you know, like you, Brendan, uh, great friends, you know, how many best friends can you have? Well, Baron Short, who had done uh, a lot of integral stuff, uh, he's a psychiatrist, professor of psychiatrist, uh, psychiatry. Um, actually, his day job is working on transcranial magnetic stimulation, e ECT, and a, as a psychiatrist, uh, working on sort of what we would call the Mind 1A firmware. And you talk speak, Mind 1A is the neuro non conscious neurocognitive processing. So he he his day job is how you shake that up and assist psychiatric mm -hmm. conditions uh, toward that. Um, but his whole view is essentially a broad mindfulness, what he called full spectrum or multimodal mindfulness. And he had built this whole process. And then he found when he encountered you talk that it was the system he was looking for, hmm. um, that it, it provided sort of the third person objective logical architecture to what he had seen through his exploratory mindfulness philosophical element. So UTIC stands for the unified theory of the tree in the knower. And so and what and he he developed a four part blog series that we put up on Unified Theory of Knowledge Media blog that takes you through your own personal theory of knowledge, what he calls your P-talk. You have your own personal theory, and it shows you how to pay attention to your philosophical assumptions and your embodied empirical experience. And he organizes that through his system, and then he evolves it into the metaphor of a tree inside of you hmm. and shows that the tree inside of you can then be placed to the Utah tree of life and then fuse that together so that the subjective path, the UTIC path, is the process by which your subjectivity wakes up, expands its horizons, and then gets organized by the Utah framework. That sounds like a badass uh, session. <laughs> That's a pretty badass session. That's I'll be actually cool. moderating that session and I'm really looking forward to that it. That is really cool. Um, yeah, thanks for unpacking that because, uh, wow, so fascinating. So many interesting things going on in there. And 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 that's what's so cool about you talk is one one minute, you know, we're talking about just, yeah, the, the neurocranial, you know, neuronal networking stuff of the unconscious mind one. And then this next day, it's, you know, pure awareness. All these things kind of have a place and can be sort of linked up with each other uh, because of the affordance of this framework. And um, it, it, you know, to bring all those things together in one uh, session is, is fascinating. So uh, really, uh, really, I cool. really encourage folks to check that one out. I'm, I'm really, yeah. forward. and what, what I'm excited about UTIC is actually, you know, Utah, it is a hard system to learn. And I, so, you know, look at the 500 page book I wrote. It's all academic shit. There's the background here. Mm -hmm. This one's much more like, hey, who are you? Where are you? How do you experience mm -hmm. the world? What's relevant to you? And now, hey, this might be really valuable if you're looking for a way to make sense out of stuff. So yeah. it's much more experience near subject relative. Uh, yeah. So I think that if we get that language right, that that can really connect to a lot of people. Well, that's another thing I love about you talk too is that it 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 spans, um, you know, on the one hand, you've got yeah, you know, the the all that this academic work and the five hundred page books with all the citations and you unpack it in this lucid discursive you know way. Um, but like, uh, to be fair, you know, like most people aren't going to read that stuff. And so it also though has all this imagery, the symbols, terms, and kind of a, a language, uh, you know, that you can learn that doesn't, it, it, it's, it relies on all that other stuff, but it's sort of like, it's the front facing kind of way of engaging with it. That's also, you know, uh, something that kind of anyone can operate and use and it's, yeah, to, in, in, you know, brings all the insight without, uh, necessarily being loaded with all the um, kind of academic weight as well. But for me personally, right, the fact that all that academic stuff is behind all this is like, is what is what makes the you talk what it is because it, it's that's the that's the depth right because other i mean people could hear some of this being like p talks and trees and coins <laughs> you know what is this a bunch right. of bullshit and it's right. sort of like you know without the incredible erudition and learning behind all of this um you know it would just be some other system that people yeah. create but yeah. the fact is you know all this is rooted in some really um... well let's let's face it on the surface the quack meter can be high it can look <laughs> weird it can look excessive and all this other stuff uh so it is there's no woo here there this is natural science into social science this is embedded in a long study as an academic my dad's a professor i've been a professor and it's embedded in the ac academic architecture so whatever level of, of authority that affords at least for folks that are rightfully 
curious, but also skeptical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be, it is good to know that. And actually, I think in terms of why it will afford cumulative knowledge is because actually it's embedded yeah. in a really systematic. So I appreciate all those kind words. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, all right. Well, just rounding this out then. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there are many other uh uh sessions symposia going on I'll, I'll link the last one um though that we'll we'll just name because it's the concluding one and also you know yeah uh, folks dear to my heart um is the science wisdom in god session say a little bit about what what this is to wrap up the the conference at 3 p.m right so one of the, the in terms of the imagery and you can see it up here a little bit uh so the the garden is the, a protopian notion it's sort of like okay how do we cultivate adaptive wisdom living. Uh, that's really what I do as a psychotherapist. And it's an invitation to be oriented toward the cultivation of human flourishing, uh, increase of dignity, well-being, integrity, all in relationship to what? Well, there's the ultimate transcendence of goodness, loving goodness, truth, and beauty. Uh, the argument is, is that there's sort of a potential pinnacle of ultimate concern, what I call the concept of God. Uh, so in you talk, then, uh, you know, that's represented by the elephant sun God. Uh, and so what we are bringing folks together uh, is uh, Layman will lead and Benita and other, uh, you know, really interesting thinkers along this line will, be, will share their views on God and the concept of God. I think it's relevant for, you know, how I as a naturalist think about it, how Layman with his metamodern post-metaphysical spiritualists think about it, how Benita Roy's think about it from sort of a post whiteheadian view fascinating stuff there. And quite frankly, in a show, you know, I like it because in the terms of brotherhood, uh, it is a bridge to uh, the metamodern spirituality retreat uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I'm looking forward to being there for. And I know Layman will be leading and those have been uh, some great weekends I've had up there and I'm, I've had it starred. So uh, the last weekend in May, of course, uh, will be hosted at Sky Meadow. Uh, so, and I really love the fact the conference is sort of bridging mm -hmm. uh, to uh, that retreat. That's why I set it up that way. So sort of the pinnacle of Utah's transcendent aspiration is going to happen then at Sky Meadow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and and that at least brings us to meta modernism, which I, it's funny. We I, I don't know. I saved it for last because I figured we'd go more into depth, but we've gone into a decent amount of depth for all these. So I don't, maybe I'll just plop this back in where it is in the actual schedule, or we'll just uh, talk about it here now. Uh, but yeah, you and I and Jason Storm, let's talk about this symposium. I'm super excited for um, this is going to be one o'clock on uh, what is it? That's Saturday, right? right? Uh, I think it's on. Is that on Friday or Saturday? I think. Oh, no, that is Friday. Friday. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. One o'clock on Friday, uh, yeah. the 12th. Um, uh -huh. And uh, and so, yeah, Meta Modernism, yeah. you talk in the future of theory. Uh, Dude, this is I'm pumped. Yeah. I'm pumped <laughs> about this. And, and yeah. I've been living it this this, this morning. Uh, OK, so just for for people and they know you guys know this because when we you know we we shared a little bit of love on the you talking with greg because you produced that unbelievably super cool book uh the cultural logic cultural logics uh the really to me lays out the meta modern worldview and in in such resonance and clarity for me that did at least and then uh you talk about uh storm in that book you introduce you have a whole chapter more or less devoted uh, to his work, Metamodernism, The Future of Theory, um, which I thought was a fascinating description. Uh, and, and that sparked my interest in it. I then read the book. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, and I really, really, uh, to see, and it's similar to the, and I look forward to dialoguing, sort of when John and I met and I listened to The Meaning Crisis, I was like, oh my God, a cognitive scientist philosopher climbed up the psychology world, Okay. Uh, and this is like, oh, my God, religious studies and and, the you know, sort of social science, humanistic transformation relative to the postmodern world. So John's like, oh, the chaos of cognitive science. Well, sort of the value, but also dead end of postmodernism clearly hit Jason Storm. And he was like, what is the constructive alternative? Uh, what's the constructive step of evolution that really allows us to pull knowledge off of the social sciences and humanities, what he calls the human sciences, and what is the right paradigm for that? Uh, and so he lays out the outline, the beginning of a conversation in that book, uh, and I think he does a really excellent job, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from him uh, and and sharing with him what I think is a very complimentary view uh, in relationship to you talk. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah the plan is he'll you know talk about his work and you'll talk about your work and I'll be kind of moderating that and or not, not moderating or maybe I am I'm not sure what the my technical role is but I'll I'll be sort of facilitating that conversation facilitating that, yeah. yeah and uh and sort of bridging these things and people will have some chance to talk to you and to Jason and to me and uh and and then we'll open it up and and that sort of a thing and um yeah I'm really excited um you know I've been engaging 
with both of your work, you and, and Jason's work for a while and already doing some kind of connection synthesis stuff. Um, and in some ways just, you know, it, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg because there's, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to all that. Um, but well, I feel like, I'll yeah. share an opening comment I'll make yeah. at the, at the thing, because this is, um, so consilience, uh, E.O. Wilson's consilience is that, okay, there's these three great branches of learning, the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. And what is their interrelation? Okay. Um, so the meta-modern view, as it's defined very clearly uh, by Storm, is sort of like, okay, well, our task here is to see the social sciences and humanities, yoke them together, as a, and what's the right paradigm to hold that relation? So it's a bridge between those two branches. He doesn't talk a lot about the natural sciences. However, the way he frames hylia, uh, hylosemantics and other types of structures, he's trying to get it. Ground, he's trying to get language in the world. He's trying to get culture in the world uh, and trying to bit. But it, but what's missing from my vantage point in that van is, A, what is the bridge to the natural sciences? Exactly. Like, how do we get that? So you talk with its view on psychology down to the natural sciences can be thought of as really the natural science to social science bridge. It certainly points to the humanities, but not really, it certainly doesn't fundamentally address it's really about getting the natural sciences and problem the problem of natural philosophy up to speed and connected to human psychology to lay the groundwork for the base of the social sciences. That's what I'm doing. So what he's doing then is he's saying, hey, this is the value of postmodernism. And you know this, but I'll just say the value of postmodernism, we can transform the paradigm to a metamodern and have a constructive holding of that bridge. So you talk between natural science and social science, the metamodern paradigm and sensibility or whatever between the social science and the humanities. And then when we see the intersection of the way he's framing language, the way he's framing value, the way he's framing realism, I'm like, man, that there is a huge amount of synergistic exploration yeah. to be done. Yeah. And actually it was funny because um in the in last year's consilience conference, um, yeah, my paper kind of tried to bring all those things together in talking about, through the lens of meaning, like talking mm -hmm. and not just, of course, your and Jason's work, but I was also drawing on Verveke's and, and Bobby's and others. But um, but really this, yeah, this coherent vision coming into view here, which for me is, it just, it's like a key unlocking something, you know, that just like, uh, you who was it you were mentioning earlier? Was it was it Baron or was it it was someone who who you know it's just obsessed with the issue of value in the world, no, right? Steve Which is Quackenbush, yeah, yeah, Quackenbush, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. like for me, I can totally relate to that and sympathize with it. And it's been such a thorny issue because in some ways, you know, mo modernity comes along and it's like, oh, actually, things don't have value inherently, objectively. You know, tr yep. you know, how do you measure value? How do you yep. study it? Blah, blah, blah. And so there's this whole crisis of value and meaning in that sense. And then postmodernity comes along and it's like, uh, you know, oh, it's just, you know, it's all just subjective or, or a cultural construct. It's mediated through, you know, entirely through kind of power structures, this sort of a thing. And trying to, in that context, find a sustainable, deep relationship with meaning and value and wisdom. It's like, you know, good luck with that, right? Especially if you're, if you really do hold to the genuine insights of the naturalistic frame that, that, you know, that modernity, uh, kind of brought to, to the conversation. And so I feel like this meta modern conversation has been able to bring so much clarity to this issue through, you know, the synthesis of your work with John Verveke's work. Um, and then, you know, in, in terms of the sort of transjective relationship and the complexity and information, you know, theoretic terms that can really uh, bring all these things together into a coherent way. And then specifically with Jason's work, trying to uh, critique and move beyond a lot of the kind of postmodern uh, semiotics and ass assessments of meaning and value to link that deeper into sort of a, a more uh, more continuous relationship with like our 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 uh, kind of you could say our animal kin right the more mm -hmm. than human world yep. as well and then seeing uh, the unique way that that language um, is actually tied to things in the world and not this sort of uh, semiotic you know endless deferral of meaning that yep. the postmoderns thought we'll be talking about all this stuff I'm sure at least touching on some of this stuff totally. but uh, but the point is all this does start to emerge into this gestalt. Uh, of of a of a worldview of a new way of looking at reality that is meaning rich value rich um, and it's just a total game changer um, in this situation that we find ourselves in right now beset by crises beset by a meaning crisis and a and a confusion about value a confusion about truth um, that just feels like an answer that the world would would benefit from engaging with and so uh, that's why I'm excited for 
this conference, um, you know, because I feel like this is maybe for some people going to be, yeah, their first kind of foray into this this world of ideas. Um, I guess I'll briefly mention too, though, that uh, the videos from last year's conference are probably still up online in various yeah, places. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. can gain access to those. Uh, either they're, each individual can share uh, the, or you can buy the package for 30 bucks. We'll decide how we put out these, but these will all be everybody that's a presenter will get a copy so if you if you're interested in any of those you can't do it you'll get a copy uh, if you register at all for the conference you should be able to get a copy uh of the videos and at the and we may put them up behind a small paywall we'll see we did that last year but if, you, you, if you're interested in these you can't attend you will be able to gain access to them yeah and and also this conference um again suggested donation of ten dollars but you can yep. sign up for free you can sign up for free if you yep. want to go see one thing i totally respect that it's the way we want it available uh both at a price level for anybody um and at an interest level for anybody um yeah. and we do invite folks to cover their costs that's basically yeah. it's ten dollars. yeah it costs price. money to put this thing on and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, money and time yeah, this yeah. Is, <laughs> it yeah. took more than an hour to pull yeah. this together we'll <laughs> right <it> that way. <laughs> um and you know presumably like just it's like it's kind of like a Lay's potato chip bag, you know. You can't just have one. So you know, if you're gonna, if you look at the lineup, you probably can't just watch one of these or attend one of these. You're gonna want to go to multiple. I think it's a pretty of... exciting lineup, man. Yeah, I, I think it's I great. Um, um, this was awesome. I think, yeah, hopefully this gives people a sense of this, um, puts it on their radar at the very least, and um, you know, uh, I think it's really good stuff. Um, you know, I guess the, the last thing, two points I want to make about all of this is that. Um, well, on the one hand, some people might hear this and be like, tree of knowledge, epistemology, ontology, what? But for me, it all comes down to wisdom. How do we live wisely in the world? How do we assess what's valuable, what's true, what's good? Um, and and despite the fact that, you know, there's a really deep level that that rewards people the more you dig into all this framework and, and you talk that you can go very deep into all this and you can, you know, you can read the academic books and you can do all of that. And it's in, you know, incredibly enriching that way. Um, but at the same time, it also just has a daily uh, significance for people in just how they live their lives, how they make sense of themselves. Um, and I think provides the right orientation to these crucial issues that we're all kind of grappling with right now. Um, and so I just wanted to say well, yeah, that. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And so uh, um, maybe I'll sort of just wrap up the at the uh, sort of, there are six take home messages mm. uh, that uh, for you talk for, that's uh, that's just framed at a, at a different level or at a, I guess at a more everyday level. Um, so the first take home message is, hey, the enlightenment gave us matter versus mind. We don't want to be thinking about that. We want to think about Energy, matter, life, mind, culture, or mention that. So that says, hey, and and you can do that in your own self. You're a talking, cultured person. You're just a, you're embodied at a mind animal level. That's your seeing and moving level. You're a living organism. You're a material object in an energy information field. Like that's uh, that's a very reasonable scientific description of those different layers. Uh, so where's mind? I mean, that that gives it. Don't split it that way. Layer it the, through these areas. Um, the second one is, yeah, actually, we need a concept of minded animals. Um, we're minded primates. Uh, that's a, That gets into how do we think about the mind? Well, actually, it's sort of like it's an embodied sensory motor loop, really, first. Mm. Um, and, and that's the first layer of mind that we should really be attending to. We're also justifying persons. So, so, the, so this energy, matter, life, mind, culture, we're minded primates that are also justifying persons. Okay, so then you think about, well, what makes us so different than other animals our technology is one thing, and then it's that we justify. Uh, that's our both proposition. It's the structure of propositional language so that we can question and reason uh, things through, and that that's actually a generative, evolving thing. Uh, so we gain recursive knowledge <laughs> based on previous justification systems. Mm -hmm. You know, we should think about that. Um, uh, the other thing that you talk does is it shifts into more applied structure okay and 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 we haven't talked too much about this but there's a whole psychotherapy angle here you talk delineates what's called the common core um and actually it really reduces uh our a lot of our maladaptive patterns sort of called neurotic loops uh and basically bad shit will happen you'll feel bad and then it's how you relate to that relation uh and you talk diagnoses these as neurotic loops and gives you a map of human adaptation um 
So in terms of like, hey, the, Utah can teach you pretty pragmatic things about how to respond, how you're likely to respond. I might get in trouble. Um, and then it introduces to what's called a calm MO approach. Uh, there's even calm MO flashlights. Uh, basically, it's a mindfulness approach to attending to when you're injured, when you're feeling defensive, uh, how to form relationships with other people that are curious, accepting, loving, compassionate, motivated toward value states, how to form that relationship with yourself. Uh, this very pragmatic stuff. Um, and so that's the fifth is like, hey, there are neurotic loops. You can shine a calm MO. And finally, and we related to this at a big picture level, we're at the time of the fifth joint point. Like the, the information, our, our technological world is built into artificial intelligence, the internet, and God only knows what's coming out of this computational level. That's going to transform us uh, because what you talk says is once you get new information processing, communication networks, things get different <laughs> real quick. Uh, we're in that. Uh, so if we can see ourselves as an unfolding wave of energy, matter, life, mind, culture, uh, if we can recognize we're both minded primates and justifying persons, if we realize that the way we react to sit sometimes traps us in a maladaptive cycle, we can shine a calm MO flashlight on that. And collectively, we're at the time of the fifth joint point. Um, those are take home messages that I think uh, people can kind of relate to and give them sort of a new cultural grammar, uh, both for where we come from, where we are, and where we might want to head. Yeah. Well said. I mean, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll just note that a system this comprehensive, you know, there's so many ways into this, right? Because like, you're right, we didn't even really get into any of the psychotherapy because like, that's not, I'm not a psychotherapist. I don't do so much in that. But you could just come into this through the lens of psychotherapy and find all this wealth just from that lens alone. Um, and so, yeah, there's something here for kind of everyone in a sense. Uh uh, yeah, cause there's, there's just so much to it. Um, but, um, but yeah, in terms of those take home messages, that's really important. And some of that languaging around these terms of like joint point and all this stuff, like, you know, the, the more kind of you become familiar with, uh, some of these terms and, uh, and the ideas behind them, um, it really just starts to kind of click into place in the, has a kind of, yeah, again, sort of a comprehensive, uh, sense making, uh, capacity for all this. So, um, yeah, I think, well, let's leave it there. Uh, because I think this was wonderful and this was oh, a great yeah, overview. Great. Um, really and appreciate. so, yeah, thanks for the time. We're excited. And, uh, so yeah. if, and if you even find out about this late or you can't do this weekend, we'll have them taped, uh, reach out to us. We'll make sure that there's a, uh, there's a connection team at you talk world. My little group, uh, will handle any emails that people have, uh, anybody that this sounds really interested we're we'd love to talk with you about it. We're excited about it and we would welcome. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see you this weekend. Amen. Oh. <laughs> right. I, I hope so. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Greg. All right, friend.